Welcome to Artflix on CBA TV. My name is Muti Olawi, and today we are going to the new world. The new world of la 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 la. What is la 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 la? When we get there, we'll get to understand what this new world is all about and who we will be dealing with in this new world. See you there. Thank you for joining us once again. Um, we're in the new world and we're dealing with um, Christopher Merrill from the Department of English Language, or let's say the Department of English at the University of Iowa in the United States. Christopher Merrill has been in the literary world for over 40 years and currently is the director of International Writing Program at the University of uh, Iowa. And uh, he has represented United States at various capacities with UNESCO. He has involved himself in a lot of projects that project the image of the new world. So this is why today we will be dealing with him extensively. Welcome to the show. Very nice to be with you. Thank you. Our viewers are a bit concerned. We are talking about the new world. The, most of them might be thinking we are dealing with uh, another environment set up by maybe a government, a new government, or that no one has ever been to before. So what is new world, especially? Well, how would you explain the new world to our viewers? Well, uh, it is conventional to think of the United States as being a, a, a great superpower, but in fact... My country uh, is a country made up of immigrants uh, from around the world. Uh, that experiment in liberty, which is one way to think about the United States, began with Puritan migration to New England in 1620. This is a story dear to my heart because uh, my first relative in the New World was one of the more notorious or perhaps famous uh, Puritan divines, and that was Roger Williams, who, effect, who was eventually banished from Massachusetts, and he founded uh, this very tiny state of Rhode Island, where the, the key phrase of which was uh, he enshrined the idea of liberty of conscience, which eventually became the notion of the separation of church and state. That's one of the many different histories of the world. And decade after decade, since the 1620s and 30s, uh, people have come to this country from different lands to make new lives. And that's one of the reasons why we call it the, the new world. And f how this gets played out for writers is that in every generation, uh, I would say that bold explorers, bold literary explorers, find new ways to tell us stories and poems and plays and films about the, what it's like to live at a particular moment in history. All right, I've been explained this. Um, how, uh, what makes the New World literature unique among other literary world or, or literary work of art in other parts of the globe? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we, again, we are a country made up of immigrants. So we have a great diversity that may not be so apparent if you look at only at the political landscape of this country, but in the cultural sphere, we have uh, great writers from every possible ethnic uh, configuration, uh, every possible religious uh, tradition. Uh, so when I look around uh, the country right now, I think about uh, a writer like Ian Li, a wonderful Chinese-American writer who came to Iowa in the mid-90s and had very little English. She was here really to uh, figure out how to, uh, how to be a botanist or a, or a biologist. She ended up taking creative writing classes and in the 20, 25 years since then has become one of our most interesting writers, a writer who's rooted in China but lives an American life. You could say that about uh, 
our Hispanic uh, American writers, our African American writers, our Russian American writers. One of the most interesting poets working today is uh, Ilya Kaminsky, a, a, a poet born in Ukraine, uh, but who writes only in English. So these are different writers coming from different tra traditions, often languages, who come to this place to make new lives and write in, an, in the new American speech, which is always, always changing. Is it true? I need you to clarify this with us. Is it true? Because I've asked a lot of writers and I've uh, had conversation with a lot of people. Um, is it true as someone in the area of academics and someone who is in the area of projection of uh, the new world culture, is it true that drama is fading away? from the literary hub of the new world? Oh, I, I wouldn't say that at all. And I, my younger daughter is, uh, is an actor. So uh, if I were to say that, she would be really angry at me. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of new and, and very interesting uh, playwrights at work. And, and the big cultural phenomenon of the last decade surely is the, what Lin-Manuel Miranda did when he uh, put together that musical titled uh, Hamilton, which is just a, an incredible new work uh, bringing together so many different kinds of voices and rhythms and ways to conceive of a musical. So, you know, there's a lot of really interesting musical theater going on, a lot of straight uh, theater. And then, of course, uh, all the what happens in Hollywood, uh, filmmaking, TV, right now with the... Uh, advent of things like Netflix and Amazon and Sony Pictures. There are so many studios uh, creating new kinds of uh, entertainment, uh, at the root of which always is that, that commitment to trying to, to storytelling. We say in Iowa City that we are a, a narrative nursery, uh, a place where writers come to learn how to tell stories, whether in poetry or prose or on the stage or in film. Uh, we, at the end of the day, you have to know how to tell a story, right? So what has changed so far in the literary activities of the new world? I mean, from the past, you've been in this area for several years. What has changed so far from the time you've uh, entered the literary hub up to today? Well, the, far too many changes to be able to catalog all of them. But I will, I will note that when I started out writing in the 19, early 1980s. As a poet, that would have been a time of uh, people writing uh, a kind of free verse, a sort of confessional free verse, but reactions were already beginning. Uh, uh, and those reactions took many different forms. One form would be for a certain group of poets to write in more formal traditions, for another group of poets to think of uh, poetry as something akin to the abstract expression artistic movement where language uh, became the, the key component. Um, that we've had uh, successive waves of poets uh, interested in exploring issues of identity, uh, issues of social justice. Uh, perhaps the most famous poem of Book of Poems in the last 10, 15 years by the African-American poet Claudia Rankine a book called Citizen, which is made up of poems, many, many prose poems, uh, and that has struck a nerve deep in the consciousness of writers. So uh, a lot of experimentation, a lot of people working in different kinds of forms, and uh, the, their attention drawn to different matters. After 9-11, for example, there was uh, a great deal of attention paid to on the political level, uh, issues of terrorism, uh, religious fundamentalism, that had people concerned. In the last 10, 15 years, I've noticed a great deal of attention being paid to the climate change catastrophe awaiting us. Uh, we have a very rich tradition of nature writers uh, with lots of magazines and publishers to work. And now, of course, in the midst of this pandemic, I imagine that we will see a whole new slew of writings about uh, what it means to find ourselves in this same boat as everybody on the 
planet. Though, of course, at this moment in the United States, we are really experiencing the ravages of the pandemic worse than anywhere else in the world. So what are old and experienced literary writers doing today? Or what they have been doing from the, uh, since uh, the time they've established themselves to sustain the spirit of literary activism among the youths and even reading culture in the state specifically? Well, one of the ways that ri American writers make a living is that they often teach at colleges and universities like the University of Iowa with its very famous writer's workshop. And it might interest you to know that it is more difficult to get into the writer's workshop at Iowa than it is to get into Harvard Law School or Harvard Medical School. They have, uh, it's, it's even harder than sure. that. So, and we have in this country about 350 graduate creative writing programs where you earn either a master's of fine arts or a PhD in creative writing. And the there's an umbrella organization for all of these writing programs called Associated Writers and Writing Programs, to which it which holds a an annual conference to which twelve to fifteen thousand writers and teachers flock every every year. And that gives you a sense that Although our lives are dominated by what we see on the screen, whether it's on a TV screen or a computer or our phone, in fact, there's an enormous amount of work being done uh, off to the side, if you will, uh, and integral to every writing program. You go there to learn how to write, but you also go there to learn how to read like a writer. So you may have writing workshops one day of the week, but another day you'll have a seminar where you're looking, let's say, at the poetry of Walt Whitman for the entire semester, trying to figure out how Whitman did what he did, how, what, what made Whitman go from being a sort of uh, journeyman journalist into one of the most important poets in American history. How did he make that move? Those are the kinds of questions that get raised in a creative writing program. And, you know, let's say at the end of the year, at the end of every year, maybe three, 4,000 students graduate uh, with MFA degrees in poetry or fiction or nonfiction or playwright. Of course, not all of them are going to be famous writers, maybe only a few will. But what they are is it creates a, a large cohort of people who take very seriously the craft of writing at the root of which is the, the serious application to reading the works of our masters uh, from not just the English language, but from other languages too. It is obvious that uh, creative writers in the New World are fortunate to have got opportunities to have uh, access to the support from government, from groups, um, non-governmental establishment, etc. Um, what are they also doing to extend the opportunity they have in a way that um, they support writers, creative mind beyond the borders? Well, one of the ways that we've done that at the International Writing Program is that we have created a series of uh, massive open online courses. Uh, we call them MOOCs. Uh, and we've done MOOCs on... Uh, writing poetry, on writing uh, fiction, on writing nonfiction, on writings for teenagers, on, on writing uh, plays. We did two MOOCs on the first on the, the, the great poem by Walt Whitman, Song of Myself, in all 52 sections. And then we wrote another, did another MOOC on Whitman about his writings during the Civil War, uh, the, that grave national tragedy turned Whitman from one kind of a poet into another kind of a poet. So we explored what he did in, the, in those MOOCs. If you go to the website of the International Writing Program, iwp.uiowa.edu, uh, you'll find there uh, all the MOOCs that we've taught in the past that are 
all of that content is available for free online. We have something like 175 videos made by uh, poets, writers, filmmakers, playwrights from around the world talking about different matters of the craft of writing. So that's all free. And uh, we try to reach out to uh, people as uh, with as many of our online resources as we can. So on the last note in this uh, part, uh, I want to have a very simple clarification here. You, you notice that in the past, we used to have public figures, politicians, even the American society appreciating creative writers, calling them to the public to display their uniqueness or to convey message to people in literary form and catch the attention of people through literary um, uh, tools. Are writers today, I mean creative writers today, still appreciated as it used to be in the past? Well, I missed part. I, I'm not hearing you. Yeah. I, I guess I would say that uh, uh, writers in, in, in my country are never going to be as famous as uh, movie stars or uh, great athletes. Um, you know, Kanye West is going to always attract a lot more attention than any poet or writer. Uh, but we do have a long tradition of writers serving as public intellectuals, people who are expected to comment on the issues of the day. And uh, when the great ones pass away, uh, there's always an outpouring of grief for them. Just in the last year, for example, we've lost the wonderful poet uh, W.S. Merwin, and there was a great outpouring of affection for him. Even as right now our country is grieving for figures like uh, Ellis Marcellus, who's died of the coronavirus, and uh, John Prine, the folk singer who also just died of coronavirus. But the, the writers are never going to be uh, held in the same, with the same affection as the, as the celebrities. Thank you so much, Professor Christopher. We have to go for a break. When we come back, we shall be exploring your world. I mean, your own literary world. And through that, we're, I'm 100% sure we'll get to know more about the new world. Let's go for a break. Hello out there. Tune in to CBA TV, the voice of East Africa and beyond. Uh, There's so many people around the world who are watching along with you. Welcome back to the second part of this new world exploration through creative mind. And with this creative mind, if you are joining us for the first time, we're with Professor Christopher. Merrill at the University of Iowa, the director of our international writing program. And he has been exploring with us the activities going on, especially the literary activities going on in the new world. So what really inspired you to enter the literary world? <laughs> well, when I was a kid, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to be a professional soccer player, and I wanted to be a poet. My father, who was a banker, must have been in despair because he knew that I would never make any money at either profession. I ended up playing soccer through college, through university. I even coached at the college level for a year. But... Uh, you know, the life of a soccer player is, is fairly short. <laughs> Your body gives out. So my, my, and it turned out my real interest was in writing, was in writing first poetry and then also prose. Uh, if I had been able to be a musician like my wife who's a violinist, maybe I would have been a musician, but uh, my talent seemed to lie in the, in the land of language. 
So who inspired you? I, I think that uh, probably the writings of Kurt Vonnegut were incredibly important to me and Hermann Hesse. And then as the years went on, I uh, started reading much more poetry by writers like uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins and John Donne and W.H. Auden and Wallace Stevens and William Carlos Williams. Those were very important poets to me. Uh, translating the poems of André Breton uh, was very important to me. Uh, I, I started reading in other languages and reading in translation. I mentioned the poet Saint-Jean Perse, whose the last line of his Nobel address is something that is always at the front of my mind. He said, and it is enough for the poet to be the guilty conscience of his time. So I try to think of all the ways in which a poet can be the guilty conscience of, of his or her time. Uh, so uh, Paris was a big influence on me. And, uh, and if, you, if I were to show you the rest of my uh, off, home office, you would see books everywhere. And it's, uh, uh, you know, I'm... I love to read, so that's, I take my influences from everywhere. So as a creative mind who has got deeply into the world of literature, especially poetry, how would you define poetry? What is poetry to you? <laughs> well, since poetry is not just about uh, making uh, an argument, since poetry is first and foremost a form of music, uh, and since poetry is, is in my view, the, the most uh, compressed way of using the language, it gives me the chance to do things in the language that I could not otherwise do. I had the good luck to study for a semester a very long time ago with the Russian poet Joseph Brodsky. And Brodsky was always talking to us about the ways in which uh, you, if you, uh, your mind is occupied with a metrical matter, uh, with what, let's say, Ralph Waldo Emerson might call an, a meter-making argument, that while your conscious mind is consumed with that, all sorts of interesting material may rise up in you. And there's a way in which, as a poet, by virtue of a rhythm or a rhyme or, or, or some other discovery, with every line you have the chance to be in a place that no one has ever been before as a writer. And I find that tremendously exciting. So we started talking about my book, Necessities. When I was doing that automatic writing, I found word by word I was in, in a new world, a place that had not been mapped or explored. And I thought I, I just found that both exhilarating and a little frightening, and so uh, that experience of following the language to a place that seems brand new is something that I just find endlessly fascinating, and it's why I keep going back and trying to trying every day to see what I can discover on the page. We are going back to your world now. We want to explore your world. We want to know how far you've gone through your creative writing. I have read a lot of your work, uh, but it will be unfair if we don't explore it together uh, with our viewers for them to really enjoy. Um, would you mind explaining what inspired you to write self-portrait with, po uh, with Dogwood? What is it about? Well, it's, it's, a, it, it's a small book that uh, an editor put together a series called The Life of Trees. It's a play on the phrase, the tree of life. And she lined up a number of writers to write a short book, 40 to 50,000 words on a particular tree. It turned out that the series didn't work, but it did work for me because when I started to write about dogwood trees, uh, I, found my, I found it was a way for me to address a number of matters throughout the history of my life. From earliest childhood to uh, of just a few years ago, it seemed to me that at every point in my life, every significant passage, somewhere or other, a dogwood tree was there in the background. And so the dogwood tree became a kind of metaphor for my larger engagement with around me. 
in natural history terms, in terms of political history, in terms of social and family life. So I just, you know, I started in early childhood and got up to about 2014, 15, and that was the book that in which I tried to address as, as clearly as I could that some of the different things that I've seen along the way. Of course, I'm talking in there about matters of like climate change, uh, the, the, the catastrophes that arise from that. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, there's, a, there's a chapter that early in the book when I was quite young, uh, our house uh, was washed out to sea in a hurricane. Uh, everything went except my bedroom. And uh, so I, you know, from the age of five on, I've known what power there is in nature and that's power to destroy. Uh, so I, I, I've taken that as something that I keep in mind uh, ever since. So I'm writing about things like that, but I'm also writing about uh, the, the cultural diplomacy missions that I do going out into the world to talk about creative writing, to try to connect with writers in different parts of the world. And, uh, you know, so one way or another, I found a way to, to, to look at those events through the filter of natural history, through the vehicle, if you will, of uh, dogwood tree. Another one I wanted to explore with us is just one word, um, a book, I mean one word when I mean uh, it's not like a phrase or maybe long words just one word you use necessities <laughs> what is this necessities because what is uh, when we say something is necessary and you say it's a necessity what are the necessities and what even push you to have this kind of write up that book has a long history, and that is that in 1989, uh, in the fall of 1989, for reasons that I have not quite figured out, I gave myself the assignment um, each day to write, um, to, to do a sort of automatic writing like the French Surrealists used to do. Around that time, I had translated uh, the book of poems, uh, the last book of prose poems by the, the great French surrealist André Breton. He wrote a book called Constellation, and I, I had that in mind. And then, I, so in the fall of 1989, when the world was changing so dramatically, when the Berlin Wall came down, uh, when East and West Germany started moving toward reunification, for some reason, for about 60 days that fall, each day I would do three different uh, prose paragraphs of automatic writing. And that became, over the next 20 or so years, the first draft of, of this book called Necessities. It's, I think, a kind of surrealist fable. It's written in prose, but I hope that the prose works like a kind of poetry. So I'm following these crazy images in different directions just to see where they might go. It was for me, I didn't publish it until <clears throat> 2013 because I was just tinkering with it for really for 20 years, um, 24 years. And, uh, but it was for me, the, I think, the book that opened up a whole new way to think about uh, writing, uh, give myself over to the language, it's, its deepest promptings to see where it might take me. And uh, I still have, uh, I, I always imagine Necessities to be just the first book of, of a trilogy, the next book uh, to be titled Migrations, and I'm pecking away at that just as slowly as I did with uh, Necessities. And so it's a kind of a project that is, that's an ongoing project in my life, even as other kinds of books in prose and poetry get, uh, get written. So how about The Three of the Dove you published in 2011? The Tree of the Doves, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a, a much different kind of book. So The Tree of the Doves that has a subtitle, Ceremony, Expedition, War. And it consists of three very long essays, 60, 70, 80 pages apiece. In the first uh, essay, I had the good luck to visit uh, Malaysia, 
uh, with a writer who had been in the international writing program named Eden Koo. And uh, he took me to uh, Kelantan, which is the northernmost uh, province of Malaysia. It's a very conservative uh, Islamic uh, uh, province. Uh, and he took me there to, to witness uh, uh, a ceremony called Main Putri, which is uh, playing the princess. It's a ceremony that had been proscribed by the Islamist government, uh, and yet it was a ceremony deeply uh, important to your average uh, Malaysian living in the, in the kampangs, the villages around uh, uh, the capital city of Kelantan. So for two nights I went to watch what was an incredible um, uh, ceremony that it, it was... It was it, it was a kind of exorcism, but it was also it had animist elements, it had Islamist elements, it had Hindu elements. There was dance and music and uh, the putting of the patient into a trance, uh, improvisatory poetry. It was incredibly beautiful. So I I ended up writing a long essay about that, but also really about the place of ceremonies in our lives, what they. The, 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 the central role of any kind of ceremony, whether it's a religious ceremony or a secular ceremony. So that got the book going. Then at the same time, uh, I had, I, I, for the second chapter, the second essay, it's called Expedition. I love the French uh, poet, diplomat Saint Jean Paris, who won the Nobel Prize in 1960. He was uh, an incredible poet. And uh, I've I've, I've lived much of my life in almost conscious imitation of his life. He was a great diplomat, but uh, also a poet. And toward the end of his first diplomatic tour in China in the, about 1920, 21, he made a trip from Beijing to Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia uh, by a train, by camel, by horseback, and by car. And so I thought I would duplicate that journey from Beijing to Ulaanbaatar on, uh, by train and use that as a way to uh, make sense of Saint-Jean Paris's writings and his diplomacy, but also to look at some other events that I had had the good luck to witness in China. I've spent a lot of time in China. And then the, finally, the last section about war, called War is about travels in the Middle East. Uh, I got caught up in a, in a little war in uh, Lebanon, and uh, so I was writing about all the, uh, all the different battles there. So trying to understand the place of ceremony, of expeditions, and wars in our lives. That made up the book, The Tree of the Doves. <laughs> you have got a very funny title that is um, so uh, hooky and catchy. And what is this title? Things of the Hidden God. The one you published in uh, 2005. Yeah, yeah. What is it about? I remember you mentioned something related to having it in three parts. What is it about? Well, I, I should back up and say that in the early 1990s, I worked as a war correspondent in the former Yugoslavia, covering the wars in... Uh, mostly in Bosnia, but also Croatia, Slovenia, Kosovo. And I wrote two big, two, one, one very big book about my time in the wars called Only the Nails Remain, uh, the Third Balkan, uh, Only the Nails Remain, Scenes from the Balkan Wars, and then a smaller book about refugees called The Old Bridge. Uh, that subtitle is The Third Balkan War and the Age of the Refugee. So after I spent, you know, years in, the, in that war zone, uh, hopping on planes, flying into the sieged capital of Sarajevo, uh, it, that, it really took it out of me um, uh, to, be a, to be a journalist in, in such a dangerous place and to see so much uh, heartache and tragedy. And toward the end of the war, um, I met a... Uh, 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 I knew a journalist in Thessaloniki, Greece, who was telling me about a place called Mount Athos. Mount Athos is a protectorate of Greece. It's a peninsula about 225 square miles 
it's a very holy place. It's the center of Orthodox Christianity's mona monasticism. And I had this idea that maybe the book I was writing, Only the Nails Remain About the War, maybe it would end in, uh, on Mount Athos. Well, that, it, that wasn't to be the case. It, the, the book on war ends in the war zone. But um, after the war was over, I was sort of at loose ends. I had some physical ailments. Uh, uh, other issues per, of a personal matter were arising. And so I made the first of many pilgrimages to the holy mountain of Athos in Greece. And I was profoundly moved by that experience and uh, kept going back. I met monks who had uh, who, who were kind enough to show me into the interior of these beautiful ancient churches and uh, with icons and all sorts of uh, treasures and uh, who were happy to instruct me in some of the elements of uh, Orthodox Christianity. And so I ended up writing a book about that too. How about Song of Myself you published in 2016? Song of Myself. As I said, uh, Walt Whitman's great poem is called uh, Song of Myself. And uh, I was invited by the U.S. State Department to try to come up with a project for what they call the virtual embassy. The U.S. does not have political relations with Iran. And so there's no embassy in Tehran. Uh, and the only way that uh, Iranians can get uh, information about the United States, at least in the diplomatic term, is by going to this virtual embassy. So I was invited to think of a way to introduce some element of American literature to an Iranian readership. And what I came up with was the idea that why don't the, the song of myself is in 52 parts. What if a colleague and I uh, were to look at each of the 52 sections week by week for a year uh, and bring and, and uh, broadcast that to Iranian readers? So as it happens, my colleague is probably the world's greatest authority on Walt Whitman, a man named Ed Folsom. And what we agreed to do was that Ed would write an introduction to each section. I would write a poetic commentary. We would phrase a question to be launched on Facebook. And then we would get all of this translated into Farsi. And so over the course of a year, we, we did in fact write commentaries on every section of the of Song of Myself, translated it not only into Farsi, but into Russian and Spanish. Uh, we use translations in Ukrainian, in German, in French, 15 different languages. Uh, so it became a, 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 a kind of global uh, exercise or experiment in bringing the words of our first great poet to, to, to life in other lands. And at the end of it, Ed said to me, well, they, you know, I just realized this is the first full length commentary there's ever been about Whitman's song of myself, so that's why we decided that we should we should publish it, at, publish the whole commentary, and now we're just about to publish a second one uh, of our uh, the commentaries and introductions that we wrote uh, to uh, Whitman's uh, Civil War writings. When, as I mentioned before, he became a much different kind of writer. Thank you for exploring with us, uh, Christopher Merrill. I, I'm. We have explored a lot, and people must have known that um, you are not just a stationed writer. You've been a journalist. You've traveled to different parts of the globe, including even countries that are no longer in existence, Yugoslavia in particular. And uh, you even experienced beyond what you least expect. You were caught in the midst of the war in the Middle East. And you escape, you, you manage to sustain yourself. And you didn't only do that. You are able to also come up with uh, something that people can tap ideas from. Even when you're no longer on this face of the planet. This is very wonderful. And we really appreciate that. As part of the tradition of this show, we don't allow 
our writer to just go score free like that without sending very important witty message or pregnant message as i used to say to our viewers what message or what last message do you have for our viewers at all well one thing that has always helped me as a writer is to have in my memory to have and to have nearby in books the pot the consolation that comes from uh, reading somebody uh, who seems to understand the world better than I do and who helps me to see what my experience here is all about and so I am always on the lookout for those, those books those writings that will help me to just makes me think you know uh, I was once in a basement in Sarajevo uh, during a, a an intense show uh, uh, the, the building and this went on for more than 24 hours. It was quite frightening. And there were 12 of us in this basement. And at one point, someone said, uh, what's the best book to read in a bombardment? <laughs> and she was reading a book called The Destruction of Yugoslavia. And we thought, oh, we're living through that. We don't need to read it. And uh, I was reading the collected poems of saint jean Paris. And a third person was reading an anthology of erotic writing. <laughs> and we all thought that was very funny. We thought erotica was probably best for uh, being in a siege. But really what I thought, and what I thought then, I think now, having that book of poems by Sacha Paris, knowing that somebody went through the li his life getting down the essence of what it means to be alive, that was all the comfort I needed at that moment. I still need it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Christopher. Meryl, um, viewers at home, I believe we have got a lot from this great writer. We have managed to get what the new world is all about through this great writer. We have explored the world of this writer extensively. The world he lives right now and the world he had lived in the past through his literary work. And that's to tell you the importance of creativity. With your creative ink, you can pen down your life. Yesterday, today, and even tomorrow, depending on how creative you, you are. So that's why it is important to read, as he has advised us. He has advised us to ensure that we read, because from reading, we become wiser. Wiser than even our cognitive level. Because we get to gather ideas of experienced people through reading. So next time, we shall be exploring another world of another creative mind in another demography. I mean, another continent. It's not going to be the new world again. It's going to be the older world. When I mean the older world, you get to understand that when we meet next time. Thank you for watching.